All right, great. Hello to everyone and welcome to our first ever leading your international school webinar. PIC works on school jobs for nearly 20 years. PIC works exclusively with leading international schools to find the best teachers and school leaders from around the world. We are honored today to be joined by three distinguished mm -hmm. founding international school principals, each with a vast level of experience, educational leadership experience across a number of countries and contexts they have worked with. Between them, they have been directly involved in the founding of nearly 20 schools worldwide. Grania O'Reilly has been in education for over four decades, more than 30 years of which has been spent in headship, both in the UK and all over the world. She has been somewhat addicted to startups as has, and has made startups a specialism within education. She is currently the executive principal for the international schools in China of Eaton House and was the founding head of the Eaton House Foshan International School in China. The Foshan International School was a 13th startup that she has been directly involved in. Next, we have our second webinar guest, John Todd. John is the founding head and director of education at Charter House Lagos, a fellow of the Chartered College of Teaching. His previous roles include the head of college and regional director of Dulwich College in China and the chair of the board of management for all of their China schools, serving as group director of safeguarding with an overall responsibility of safeguarding policy and compliance. He has also held senior roles in Qatar, Kenya, Nigeria, China, and Singapore. He recently completed an online master's in organizational leadership and is working towards an online MBA. Now we have our webinar host, Barry Cooper. Barry is the founding principal at the Global College Madrid, a role he has held since the school opened in 2021. He has 22 years of experience across boarding schools around the world and is passionate about student agency, leadership, and culture. In Edinburgh at the Loreto, school, he worked with Edinburgh University to bring a bespoke Islamic cultural curriculum to his school. And now in Madrid, he is constantly looking for opportunities to develop his students' cultural intelligence. His LinkedIn profile reads, making a difference through education. And he is certainly doing that today in his continued attempts to innovate at the Global College. Now I'll hand over to, over to Barry to start our webinar today. Thank you very much, Jane. That's that's far nicer words than I think my own mother says about me. So um, I'm really pleased about that. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with um, everyone uh, you know, in this group of peers to, to talk about uh, founding an international school um, and being here with Grania and John especially. And I think of the 20 international schools, I think most of them were probably Grania. Um, so 13 <laughs> is, a, is, a pretty, is a pretty good record. Um, I've only been involved in three. Um, so um, I think the, the start off, I suppose, for us is this opening question, what does it mean to be a founding principal? And I, I don't like the sound of my own voice. So I'm going to say about 10 words. Um, and I'm going to hand this straight over to Grania and, and see what she thinks. But for me, I think to be a founding principal means you are interested in everything it takes to run a school, and you're not afraid of hard work. Grania, what do you think? That, that is such a good, um, you know, one-liner. Um, I would say that um, the best thing is that you get the opportunity to get it right from the beginning. Um, you know, when you go into schools that are already established, one may have to spend considerable time um, undoing things. Um, if one feels very passionate about one's mission and one's values and all of those things. But when you start a school, you do get the opportunity to, uh, as I say, get it right from the beginning. And to echo what you said, you really get a chance to have your hands in every single part of that school. Um, and to really build everything from the ground up. It, it's, it can be a very overwhelming um, experience, but for, for those of us, 
you know, and there are so many of us in the world of education who really feel passionately about our vision, you know, who really want to touch the lives of every child and family and hopefully um, colleague with whom we work in a very positive and dynamic way. Um, being involved in a startup is a tremendous way to achieve that. Um, what, what do you think, John? I guess a couple of things that have been going through my mind at the moment um, are thinking about responsibility. Um, because this founding principle is the person that generally will make it work or not. And this is a reflection I've done with some of my team recently. So much hinges on you. There's so much money in one way going into this project. There are so many things happening. And it's an amazing opportunity. But at the same time, you are responsible for so many things. And you want to get it right. You want to make sure you do it well. You want to make sure you meet targets. You want to make sure everything works. And, and I think the other thing I would say is knowing what you don't know. Um, there are so many things, and, you, and, and it's already been said, you've got to have your finger in so many pies. But the problem is you end up not being an expert in anything. And very often, if you've been a principal, you, you might not even be a, a, an expert on something that people think you should be, like, let's say, curriculum, because you might have stepped back from that um, and your focus is in a different area. Um, and so I think we'll talk about it later uh, this morning, but it's also being willing to put your hand up and say, guys, I really haven't got a clue. Or even sometimes I actually don't have the passion to drive this particular area. And I think why that's particularly important is when it comes to selecting your team, you've got to fill in those gaps. Yeah. Um, but that sense of responsibility at times can become quite overwhelming mm -hmm. and you, you do have to step away from it. Otherwise you can get too wound up thinking, did I get it right? And, and there is a sense you've just got to plow on with things. And, That's a brilliant and interestingly, answer. interestingly, if I could just pick up on something you said there, you know, you said being very clear about what you don't know I think one of the things that's particularly difficult for startup heads, I think for all heads, when you step into a headship, you do need to be reflective and humble and you do need to be very clear about perhaps those areas that you're not quite so good at, you know, and there may be somebody else who would be much better than, than you to take that forward. But I think for startup heads, the issue isn't just uh, knowing that there will be things you don't know, it's actually not knowing that there will be things you don't know. Because no, in startup, exactly, unknown <laughs> unknowns, precisely because the unknown unknowns, you know, this was my 13th startup and I was still faced with unknown unknowns. Whereas Can we get some examples, Grania? Um, well, I think for me, it was that there are, this is a completely new country for me. It's not a new continent. I've been in Asia before, uh, started three schools, but um, I haven't done it in China and I haven't done it in Foshan. Um, and so there are unknowns that I knew I wouldn't know because I would be new to this area, but there are all sorts of things that particularly during that first year struck me as I really wish I had had a heads up on that. I really wish I had known. And, and interestingly, and I, I hope we're going to talk about it before the end of this, um, before the end of the, the, the broadcast, you know, having something like the book that Andre and Chris have been working on to point you in the direction of things that you may never have thought about, having something that 
uh, something of that nature, you know, at your disposal. My goodness, I would have loved something of that nature when I did yeah. my first startup. It's... And indeed, here in China, I would have loved it. Mm. John, what about you? What's what's the un, what are the unknown unknowns that you faced uh, kind of initially with uh, with Lagos? I, I I think with Lagos. I mean, it, it's interesting because I've also come out of, of of China, and China is a country with a, a, a single set of rules that are interpreted differently in every single city, um, <laughs> which, which which is a challenge. Yeah. Um, and Lagos is is the same in some ways. Um, very often, the bigger challenge is knowing who to ask. Mm -hmm. Relationships are absolutely key. Rules are somewhat flexible, depending on who you know. And and to be fair, that's not so different from my experience in the Middle East or 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 in China. And so. Building those relationships, first of all, with your, your board or your, or your founders or your investors, that's really important. Understanding which battles to fight, mm. because some of them aren't worth fighting and being willing to compromise, that's really important. And I, I suspect that's a, a, a place where younger versions of ourselves fell down that whole mm -hmm. issue around pride. Um, and whereas now, I think you, you get to a point where almost you've got nothing to prove and the second, third or, or 13th time, it gets easier <laughs> because yeah. you're more adaptable. You've not got yeah. anything to prove. You know that the, what the final goal is. And, and, yeah. and, and perhaps the key uh, thing to think about here is, what is the goal of the founding principle? And that is to get your school open. And if that means dragging yourself through the mud and the dirt, cleaning the floors, making compromises about what color the walls are in your classroom or the mask scheme that you didn't quite get, the yeah. important thing is opening the school. Yeah. And sometimes people lose sight of that goal because they get down into the weeds far, far too much. Fantastic. Can we uh, move on to yeah. the, the next slide? And, and I, th I know that there was a really interesting thing here, uh, Grania, because it's what you were talking about. Acknowledge the power in knowing what you don't know. And, uh, mm. and I think what you were saying, John, leaving pride at the door, which I think is, um, is, is I think, good advice for anybody, uh, especially when you're in something as complex as a, as a, as a startup school. Um, yeah. I think the, um, the, the next question, though, is, is when we get into the, the nuts and bolts. Uh, and that's the key ingredient to a successful startup school. So we've already touched on some of these things, haven't we? It's it's you know knowing the you know who to ask. It's um, leaving pride at the door. It's you know being willing to to grab that mop and say right, come on guys, this is us. Let's go. And I know we were talking <laughs> about um, you know getting down to the docks and unloading containers. And uh, I could tell you a story about getting hold of a school three days before it opened. Um, but for, for you, John, is there is there a particular key ingredient you think we need to to give ourselves that 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 push at the start? What's the key ingredient to a successful startup school, or are there too many to talk about? I I mean, in some ways, yes. There's 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 too many. It's it's too complicated. It's a it's a big picture. I think where I'm coming from now. It's trying to understand your marketplace in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. great. You can go in with a wonderful mission and vision, but someone's mm -hmm. actually want, got to want to buy into it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's going back, and, and most schools in this position will do a feasibility study, and they will understand what the market wants and what is, what is actually needed. Where is the gap? And what was interesting for us, because we were the we were the first British independent school in West Africa. Now, you wouldn't sell that in China you, because they're everywhere. For, yes. for Nigeria, we thought this is going to be the big selling point. And it was kind of. But the reality was people looked at it and said, 
oh my God, are you really building this school here? Because what we're doing now is, is also, we can throw out some of these nice lines, uh, it's the biggest private sector investment in Nigeria, in education. Wow. And what they didn't believe is that we were actually building or were able to build in this particular economy, the structures that we're building. And people keep coming back to us and saying, really, you're building that in Lagos. And again, if you were doing it in China, it's just normal, but we're not. We have Chinese building it in, in Nigeria. And so we kind of switched our whole thinking around, well, people are far more interested in the wow factor of the buildings and the fact that we're doing something very different. It's less important that it's British. The brand itself is important, but less important. So we then changed our focus around all these amazing facilities. No one else has got them. They're better than the universities. So without going too far, yes, you've got to stick to mission and vision. You've got to stick to brand. You've also got to tell people what they want to hear so that they will mm. buy into it because mm. there is, a, there is a, a sense that you've got to get some bums on seats on the first day. And you can Fantastic. do something amazing. And if no one comes, it ain't going to work. So think about what it is that people want to buy. Be honest about it. But 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 focus on what they're looking for. Mm. Rania, how is this how is this idea of a of kind of key ingredient then change from your experiences across East Asia? Because having done thirteen, I think you have you seen a, a trajectory and a change in what makes a successful startup, or has there always been that common denominator that you've always gone right? We need this. I, I think that's I think that has has really been key from doing a number of them. Um, I, I've been able to separate out what is the issue here, whether that be this locale, whether it be appealing to the local market, you know, are we appealing in the right way, whether hmm. it's about the country or the part of the world one finds one in, or whether it is actually about the fact that this is a startup, because they are, they can be two very different things. In fact, there are three things. Is it about us as a school? Is it about us as a startup school? Or is it about where we find ourselves? And so for me, having done many of them, I have a sort of a, a blueprint now that is simply and, and in a very focused manner about getting the school open and ensuring that you've got everything in place to make sure that it's sustainable. Now, yes, there will be lots of elements of that that you will have to refine because of where you find yourselves. You may have to take different directions in terms of your marketing. You do have to be very sure that there really is the waiting population who want to mm. buy your product. You know, you, you've really, and so many, I, I have to say, so many schools, so many companies open, and whilst there may be some, um, you know, demographic information, there may be some uh, logistical know-how in terms of the local area and relationships and things of that nature, I have seen so many schools come to places where there simply is not the need or the desire for that school. Um, mm. So, of course, you have to be nimble. You know, you've really got to stay on your feet. Um, it is like trying to get a basketball all the way down the court. Um, but, but for me, having done many of them now, I'm really clear about what my vision is, how I share it with everybody else, you know, to get them to buy into it and believe that it's their vision too, and what all of the steps are going to be. I, I think people find me a tad pedantic 
uh, you know, I'm a very big picture person, but then when they actually work with me, they realize I'm very detail orientated because it doesn't matter how fabulous your vision is, you really do need to know what all of those individual steps are going to be. Just like you said when we opened, you know, you really have to be interested in every single thing. You know, it isn't just about the curriculum, it's the plumbing. It isn't just about, um, you know, what your, which accreditations you're go, going to go for. It's whether or not the AC is working. It isn't just about your marketing department and ensuring that they are giving the right message. It's about making sure that your staff and your teachers really are providing what your marketing team are saying you provide. So you, you really do have to have a, a finger in all of those pies. So for me, it would be, being very clear about what the mission is to get the school open and to ensure that it's sustainable, you know, so planning for three to five years and making sure that you know every single step of that before you even begin. Fantastic. And Barry, can we can I sorry, yeah. Can I just pick up can I just pick up there on 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 something is is that sense that keeps coming out of breadth. Um there are so many things and and, and I think a lot of people think oh get the curriculum right get the mission and vision right um yesterday <laughs> i was online and we, we, you know we're in a in, in a, a country with some security challenges helping to design the armory where our local police force will store their guns that's yes. not in the job description the mpqh <laughs> that people do or anything um it's it's these kind of things where you just think okay uh, yeah, let's find out how you design an armory, uh, and and you but, just but have to kind of. That's run the beauty. With it. Of, that's the beauty of, of of startup schools in in new places yeah. and and creating new things. Absolutely, I think um, I think what you've what you both said has resonated with what we we've, we've done here, and I think the the pre planning, and I think you've both said actually, John Granier, the 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 need is the need there. Is there a demographic base? Have has the due diligence been done? And I think I've equally seen um, these startup schools come and also go because there was just a, a complete failure to recognise either the local population yeah. or indeed also legislation that then is put in place that can curtail the <laughs> numbers that yes. can come to your school. And that, that again is another another issue. And you're dealing with local stakeholders and and getting into that world and understanding what's on the ticket what's coming next over the next two or three years yeah. what can you tell me about what may may come and you know bite us in the behind i think the mm -hmm. um one of the things on here i know we're going to talk about it later as well is is the recruitment journey um and bringing teachers on board who believe in the vision and can 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 take that forward and i think maybe if we go to the to the next question we can kind of really dig into the other side of this which is the major challenges <laughs> Um, hmm. what are the what are the roadblocks um what are the the things that are gonna jump up and 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 are stopping you from doing what you need to do um from from my perspective these have come in all shapes and sizes and I don't think they sometimes the very what what initially seems to be a very small uh, challenge can actually have a major impact in the opening of a school uh, and stopping it from coming open so that can be local administration that can be uh ensuring the building is signed off and i've seen you know problems with that happen around the world uh to the the much bigger you know uh political crises and, and so on so mm. i mean from from your perspective Grania, i go to you again what's what are the, what have been the major challenges maybe from your experience and and what do you think are the the things that we as starting principals as, as startup principals can look at and prepare for maybe um to make sure we're seeing you know with that lookout that the eyes of that lookout what's in the distance and what can we try and avoid well we've all had situations you know where stuff didn't turn up i mean i opened one school without a single chair Everybody had to bring their own their own chair with them on the first day at school. You know, we pretended it was a British tradition to get everybody to do it. Um, so we've all had those sorts of issues where nothing has turned up. But the biggest issues, the biggest challenges will be, and I think you've sort of really, you've referred to them, or certainly we've referred to them, 
The first one will be people literally not turning up. If you do not have your staff, you cannot open your school. Um, and in my, in my first startup, we didn't get those visas until about, about five days before the school actually opened. We didn't know if we would have any teachers. So, you know, having, um, having a plan B and a very big plan B uh, was really important. Uh, legal impediments is, is a huge one. And it's, um, it is very often the hill you find that you die on. Um, because uh, you can be given a very clear and a very hard no. And that is where it is so important that you do have um, research and very clear demographics before you um, set about the challenge and that the owners, the board, um, you know, the company, whomever that may be, that they really have a genuine understanding of what is happening in that area. Um, and then I would say that um, the other one is um, simply that the school is physically not ready. That happens so often. Yes. And in some ways, you almost have to assume that that is going to happen. You know, I've had a run ups of a few months to open a school. I've had run ups of literally a few days. When I opened this school, I arrived on the Friday night and I opened the school on the Monday morning and was doing everything, you know, at a distance to try and get it uh, ready. And, um, you know, assume that the worst is going to happen. Um, I, it sounds very pessimistic, but it really has worked in my favor. I always assume that no one's going to turn up in terms of my staffing. I always assume that we will not have everything we need on that first day or even anything that we need on that first day. And that doesn't mean to say that you can't teach. You know, you can have some extraordinarily creating, creative teaching going on. Um, but also I'm going to assume that the answer to everything is going to be no. And if you assume that the answer is going to be no, to everything that really does start you thinking about, well, if the answer is no, how can we either frame the question differently or how can we change our practice or how can we present ourselves to find a way for that answer to be yes or maybe. I, I've opened a lot of schools in um, situations that were very much maybe. Um, safety is a big issue. I've had one or two, one or two schools um, in the US in particular because the rules are so extensive with regard to health and safety and to licensing. I have had a couple of schools that were not allowed to open even after securing the building, securing what we thought were all of the licenses, having children on our books, bringing all of the staff over from the UK, Again, it, it sounds very pessimistic, but it really is valuable to plan for what will you do if that should happen. John, are you planning for what you'll do should that happen? Um, <laughs> everything's crossed. Um, I, I, I guess one thing that I think people need to think about is themselves and their people. Um, and a startup head is not the same as a head of a developing school. And if you're moving into a school that's already there and works and you're poking around at the edges and changing it, it's a very, very different set of skills mm -hmm. and a very different set of mm -hmm. leadership style in that sense. And, and part of the challenge you have is bringing your team along whilst also at times just being this dictator that says, <laughs> and I, well, I, I left uh, Lagos two days ago and I gave two or three people lists. They say, yeah. what? I say, well, you, I'm away for a month. Um, I need all these things doing, but this is three months work. That's fine, you'll manage. So you, you do have to have high expectations of people You've got to support your um, 
you've also got to get over that personal, that whole personal issue of, I'm also in somewhere very different. How am I mm. looking after myself? How am I looking after my staff? Um, and sometimes you, you go into a place and it's just you. Mm. And even though there's a team in the office, it's still just you in your apartment at night. And you've got all this responsibility and all this money hanging off the whole thing. And it actually can be incredibly lonely, yeah. incredibly emotional at times because you don't want to let anyone down because you don't want to let yourself down. And that this all this stuff about well-being that we're seeing at the moment. And I, I still think principals, heads, call them whatever, forget themselves. Yes. And so making time for yourself. What are the things that you can do? Is it reading, jigsaws, keep fit, whatever? Making sure that you find time out to do something different, to relax, to not think about school. Just even if it's for an hour a week, I think that's so important that you carry on with real life as well as, mm. as, as school life because... It, it's so easy to forget family, to forget friends, because you just so, so wound up in this project. Um, because underneath, you are the person that's driving it. You are the one that's got to have the passion. You are the one that's constantly kind of spending energy. And so how do you fill up your own tank at times? Yeah. And I, I think it's really important, A, not to forget that, but B, that is not everybody's skill set. Mm. And sometimes school or, or board owners will say, well, they have run an amazingly good school. Let's pull them in to start this school. And that's not what people do. Some mm. people are not good startup principals because they have a different set yep. of skills. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think those, uh, I, I think you've touched on something that's, probably right at the heart of, of of doing a job like this and that is the ability to to take a step back to look after yourself and and you know to do that there are different mechanisms I know you know I'm a big fan of stoic philosophy but I also seek out other people and talk to them about you know what I do and what they do um and having mm -hmm. a support network you know I've had great conversations with principals you know, around the world I in fact had one yesterday with a guy called David Tidswell who's um a head out in in China um at, uh, at zebra uh so it's it's a i think it's a really important thing to take away from today i think from anyone who's listening that the mm. the ability to to look after yourself because if you don't look after yourself you can't look after anyone else absolutely i i, I think as well it, it's also and and you know we talked earlier and, and i'm really kind of scared to say uh ryan's name because i'm not quite sure how to say it properly <laughs> so i keep saying what you talked about earlier because i can't quite can't quite pronounce your name so apologies <laughs> um that sense of reflection because we mm. had a, 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 a we were a fairly small team and it's growing and we just came to a realization that we were all of us kind of in the weeds um, yeah. And it was the principal people, myself and my chief operating officer. And, and, and I said, you know what? I have to step back. You can continue doing the really detailed stuff. But the danger is no one's got that umbrella view because I'm focused yep. on, on little bits. You're focused on little bits. It's still got to be done. But we're taking our eye off the ball because no one's seeing the big picture anymore. Yeah. And... Yep. You, you have to be reflective and you have to be ready to change direction. And that the reality of that was, okay, I need to bring someone else in to do some mm. of the things that I was doing because if I keep doing them, it's actually not really good value for the money they're paying me, but it means I'm not doing the big thing, which is how does this whole jigsaw fit, to, fit together? Yeah. And it, it kind of goes... Yeah, it goes back to that. What is it we're trying to do? 
we're trying to open a school and my target has to be open the school, not get all the policies yeah. right, not order all the stuff, get other people to do that. I, I remember years oh, ago, sorry, just wanted to butt in yeah. there. Um, I remember years ago, uh, Martin Skelton, it was at the beginning of when we were um, training people up, you know, for the IPC. And mm. that was something very new at that time. Um, and he talked about pioneers and settlers. And they are two yeah. very, very different things. Um, you know, as a startup head, you've got to be a pioneer. And interestingly, this is the first time, this is my 13th, and it's the first time I have also been a settler because I have been here for seven years. I wanted the opportunity just once to see it all the way through to sustainability because technically, or in certainly in most cases, the person you have as your startup head should not necessarily be the settler. They, they should be that pioneer. And then a settler should be somebody who comes in to drive the school forward. It's a bit like, you know, the analogy of Churchill. Everybody thought Churchill was a fantastic war, wartime leader, but nobody wanted him during peacetime because he was yeah. great at putting out fires, but wasn't so marvelous for rebuilding the nation. So yeah. um, I, I, can, I can really see what you're talking about there, John. Mm -hmm. Grainne, did you just compare everybody listening to Churchill? Because I think everyone should take that away. That should be one of their takeaways today. I, I do. Look, are you, are you, is, are you a pioneer? That, that's one of the things I would say to everybody listening. Mm. You know, if you want to be a start-up head, and don't forget there are loads of opportunities in education. Doing a start-up is something very, very specific. Stepping into headship is in and of itself an enormous challenge. Because no matter how much responsibility you have previously been given, the feeling of the buck stops with me as a head is, is really quite overwhelming in your first headship. So, you know, there's headship and then there's startup headship. You, yes. you have to decide, are you a pioneer or are you a settler? There is no value judgment there. We need the pioneers and we need the settlers. Because it's very rare. I have to tell you that in my first startup, I could not have done seven years in that school. I would not have been the right person to not only found the school, but then develop it all the way through um, for it to become an independent being almost. Um, mm. I could not have done that in my very first startup. And, and also I was too young. You know, age helps, experience helps. You know, all of those things will benefit you in the coming years. But, but fundamentally, you know, are you Winston Churchill? Are you going to put out fires? Will you be able to um, operate on three hours sleep a night? For many, many nights. And will you be able to wholeheartedly support everyone else when you do not have any support, because it is a very lonely and exhausting position. Absolutely. Um, which means you need a decent founding team. So that's our next slide. Um, and what are the must have criteria to get in place for uh, a founding uh, a founding team uh, or founding school? But I think a founding team is probably where, where this is being driven. I think a founding team, uh, we, always, we we tend to focus on the the big kind of three aspects of our of our school: the academic side, the operational side, the pastoral side. And I I think when we're talking about building a founding team, my approach to this was very much to write down all of the stuff I was not good at, uh, and then that became the job description for the for the team that I was looking to to bring in as that that core founding founding element. And it, it yeah, you know, from for my money, it worked really well. I worked with some amazing educators. Um, mm. So, I mean, for, from from your perspective, John, then what what's the what are you looking for in a in a founding team or a criteria to get in place for a founding school? You're allowed three, yeah. according to the question. Uh, fle flexibility is probably yeah. the first one because 
you never know quite what you're going to do. And and I, I even simplify it. I, I do education and a non-education. So I look after all the education bit and my CEO looks after everything else. But it's not that simple because they don't know which books to order. And that's not education. Um, and they don't design armories. I do that, apparently. So <laughs> flexibility, I think the ability to get on together. You've, you've actually got to have someone because you're probably going to be sat in an office with this person for one or two years. And if you don't get on with them, it ain't going to work. Um, and, and then I, I guess the other thing that we're still torn on is do you get someone that thinks like you or someone one that thinks differently to you? And for the first person, so for my chief operating officer, I've got someone that thinks quite like me. But for my next people coming in, we've deliberately picked some people that think differently because there's more people and you can have more flexibility because it brings more voices into mm -hmm. the team. Yeah, and absolutely. with more than two people, you can start to disagree more. Yeah. So that was yeah. a quick, quick three. Quick three. Uh, Gronje, a quick three. I, I'm just, I, I'm conscious I, of time. I, I don't want to go I too think, far over. Yeah, I think you covered that really well. I think flexibility is key, but I would say for me, um, I would say uh, the people, you know, it's all about people. Everything is about people in a family yes. team. I want people who are, are brighter than I am. I want people who disagree with me. And I want people who have more energy than I do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting old now. And so I want the, uh, the, the opposite ends of every spectrum. Um, I like to have as much disagreement um, as possible, because I, I think we all learn. We all learn so much more from it. I think that's. I think that's an amazing point to make. I think you've both really kind of driven home that 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 thing about people. A school is a, a collection of relationships, and I think we're, as long as there's a, an element of trust within that, those relationships, mm. that disagreement mm. can then turn into really great decisions. Um, because yeah. I, I mean, I, I I can't imagine how terrible a school of you know twenty, thirty, forty teachers who think like me would be. You need <laughs> that 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 breadth of, of vision and voices and these different uh, <laughs> these different approaches. Um, biggest challenge starting new school recruitment and hiring decisions. Um, yep. mm -hmm. I mean, so how how do you go about your? Is there a philosophy for recruitment? I mean, I've already said for me, I I deliberately look for people who can do things I can't, who speak in ways that I can't, um, who have experiences I don't, um, to try and get that really, you know, I, I think of it in terms of the thousand year old teacher, you know, if someone was a thousand years old, what kind of experiences would I want them to have, you know, if I was sat down next to this pinnacle of sagacity, you know, what are they going to be able to, to give me, you know, from their, their years, their millennia of experience? How do you go about picking teachers, Gronya? How do you go about hiring? Um, I, think, um, I think when it's your founding team, um, everybody has got to behave as if they were a, a member of the leadership team, you know, especially in that first year and in the run up. And, and certainly uh, when I look back at my founding team, so many of them are now heads of their own schools because they, they had um, an involvement, um, the like of which one doesn't normally um, experience until one does become a head. So I'm probably my, the biggest thing for a startup team is I'm really honest. I'm brutally honest about startup and I do not try to sell the school um, in in fact I try to put people off and I also tell them that I am incredibly difficult to work with um, and then I you, you know people ask you for examples you can see them look like a deer in the headlights they ask for examples and then you start to talk about difficulties and you'd be amazed at the responses to them. So that the people who give you the responses that are flexible and can do and passionate and energetic are the people you want rather than the people who perhaps look fantastic on paper. Absolutely, 
as character first. John, how do you feel about mm-hmm. this, especially kind of starting uh, I, in, in Lagos? Yeah. I, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I start from the point of being honest and realistic. It yeah. is not an easy place to work. It has a bad reputation. So there's no point shying away from that and pretending it's everything's, you know, sort of bright and rosy. And so the recruitment pack, we've put together a very professional recruitment pack and it addresses the issues. It talks about security. You know, you'll have an armed escort from the airport. You can't go to certain places. So rather than people saying, I've heard that, or does this happen? You know what? We've answered the question directly. Mm -hmm. This is what you're getting. Um, I, and, and, and I think this is true, you know, it was the same when I worked in, in China. There's no point selling this beautiful rosy picture and, you know, it's a big brand. And I was working with a big brand in China. There's a reality. The brand mm-hmm. gives you credibility. The worst thing you can do is promise people the earth and they come and then they leave six weeks later. It costs a huge amount of money. You've messed up all sorts of relationships with students and families. Mm. And can you honestly tell the parents why? Because I oversold it. Because that doesn't make anyone look or feel good. Mm. Mm. Better not to have them out than to, to, to make false promises. So be very, very honest. Tell them what they're getting. Tell them what they're not getting as well. But but I think you know, like like me said, sell the opportunity. Because yeah. yes, we're doing we're saying the same thing. You're gonna have chances to to get leadership roles, you'll have chances to be promoted to the next school. These jobs are really opportunities for leadership growth. And if that's what yeah. you want yeah. to do, startup is an amazing way just to kickstart your career. Because you learn so much so fast. Because you don't have is, any choice. Yeah. If you don't learn, you die almost on the on the job. You know, you you can't you can't live. You'll drown, drown rather than die. Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely it. It is. It's a it's a breeding ground for leadership, though. Um, uh, and this is, I mean, this is why I, I try and interview, do as many first round interviews as I can to to do exactly what you're what you're talking about and set that scene. Um, the key takeaways are there on the board. I know that we're kind of inching. I think we'll probably because this is a teacher thing, we'll go at least ten minutes over. But the next topic I think is really important for startups, and I think this is something that um, people need to really dig into a little bit. And it's the the best way to communicate to potential parents your, your, about your new school. I think marketing is is a major part of the role of a startup head um Mm. the here i mean i've experienced three different startups uh, china um uh, the middle east in dubai and, and here in madrid and i think what we've done here in madrid has worked far more because of two reasons it's been in context and it's been more personal so here mm-hmm. in madrid we threw time at the issue rather than pay for adverts and pay for billboards we met parents and we talked and this is something yeah. i was talking about with my friend in in china david uh, dr david tidswell the other day he said you know it's got to be about time it's got to be about meeting people it's got to be about building relationships so i mean what how how do you communicate to potential parents does it change depending on the country you're in um and mm-hmm. what are the best mechanisms for for telling parents and families and students because as the older they get the more they make that decision um telling them about what you do and how you're going to do it um Gronya, what do you what do you think um certainly as as a startup head i mean you hit the nail on the head you have to be front and center of all of the market, all the marketing. And I would say as a startup head, you've got to be clear, you're going to be selling yourself, certainly for the first three years, 100% for that first year. They are going to be buying you. They are paying those fees because you have promised them that everything that you're going to do is going to be appropriate and child-centered and all of those things. So, of course, you want to talk about your curriculum. Of course, you want to talk about your facilities. You want to talk about your fabulous behavior model and all of those things. But fundamentally, you are selling yourself. Um, And that is something... 
as you said, as you said there, it's about time. That is what so many people do not realize. You have to go and be seen everywhere. You even have to go to the opening of an envelope. You've got to be at every single event. You've got to be at every opportunity that there might be to speak to people because even if those people's children cannot or will not come to your school for whatever reason, you are building up that ambient knowledge about the school and essentially yourself. So you have to sell yourself left, right and centre and you have to make sure that the marketing and communications department that they see you do that again and again and again so that they are giving exactly the same message and then I would say very clearly you under promise and you over deliver do not ever over promise as John was just saying do not pretend that everything will be rosy. It won't. Startups are not rosy. They come with pros and cons. Be honest about what the cons are. You know, there won't be enough children for you to have football teams in the first year, perhaps. However, for the parents, it will mean that you will have direct access to the head whenever you need it. Now, that does not happen in a long established school where you have lots and lots of layers between the head and perhaps the parents. So um, yes, I would say under promise, over deliver, and it's all about people, it's about time, and it's about selling yourself. John, how's, how does that I, sound? I think it's great. I, the one thing I would add, that we've done is being very explicit with the marketing team that it is about the personality of the head and therefore if you're meeting with a parent i'll come in sorry it will all switch to me and, and that's not about you as an individual that's because sure. the parent's buying me that's because i'm the one they're interested in <laughs> yes. and at times it's you wish it wasn't <laughs> But it is that, that that is absolutely the reality. And so our marketing team now have got it and it all comes back and it's like, no, please go away. But but it does. I, I, I think you've you've really highlighted that well. If the head struggles with that, um, or if if people don't understand that, you're gonna have a problem because people are not actually buying. A lot of the other things they're often buying a brand and a principle the rest is kind of baggage almost at times it can be so we move on to the takeaways i mean that this uh absolutely i mean the the takeaways are everything that um that you've been talking about over communicating um and and effective marketing being present in local communities and it's very much about mm. being that person who's seen um i have a disadvantage uh with this john i'm six foot ten so if i'm walking through the retiro everyone sees me so um <laughs> i you know i do i do have the occasional uh potential parent kind of come and say hello so it's uh i got followed into a supermarket once uh as they recognize me from a long distance away <laughs> Uh, so, but uh, but again, it's an advantage, um, and it's uh, an opportunity to to meet and to say hi and to and to you know build relationships, which is what it's all about. Yeah. Now, I think there's some yeah. additional questions on the um, on the the next slide, which I I thought were were super interesting. I know these have been put together by the the uh, Founder International School team, um, and I know should we just go through them as they're on the board, John? Do you want to do you want to take them and and tell us what you think about the the questions and and what your kind of ideas are? Yeah, I, I I guess what should you not focus on? In a sense, that keeps changing. Um, I, I I think the key thing there is to be flexible and go with the flow. Mm. What's important, I guess, I'll go back to is keep your eye on the prize and then do whatever it takes to get to that point. And if that means things drop off your plate, the important thing then is to make sure they drop onto someone else's and they don't get lost. Mm -hmm. um, so be flexible, be, be ready to change. When it comes to phasing a school, 
the ideal section to start with is very context dependent. So for example, I mean, the standard one is you start with primary school and build up, mm -hmm. but not everyone does it. Some start with a little bit of primary and a little bit of secondary and let's add year 10 and 11 in. It depends. The ideal thing is what is right for you and also what people are looking for. My challenge usually with these is how fair is it on the students to start with exam classes? Because mm. we know the first few years is messy. We also don't know what those kids have done. So if you bring them straight, if you're doing IGCSE or GCSE, you bring them straight into year 10, you don't know them, your teachers don't know them, your courses aren't together. How yeah. fair is that on students? Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't like starting with year 10 or year 12, because I think students suffer and that, that's not right. So I've got I've got two here. As a school leader, how do you advocate for and ensure local staff receive the recognition? Um, I think this is a really interesting one, and I think it's something that is is problematic in some countries and less so in others. Um, I think the, um, the the first thing is to ensure that everyone is included in everything, and it, I think a starting yeah. principal or a principal in any case needs to ensure that the teams are brought together at the same time, that there's no delineation between the two. I think there is, in many cases, uh, a a pay. Um, and reward uh, differential between between local staff and staff coming from overseas, and often that is because you need to attract the staff to come into into country. But I think what we have to do is we have to ensure that staff who are hired in country are getting at the very top of the profession, and they're being rewarded as as much as as as, as we possibly can. Um, I think there where you're you're really starting to win is when you have uh, the local team um, in senior positions, management positions, um, and uh, you're bringing them into the conversation on a daily basis and also using them as that that cultural touchstone. And mm -hmm. for you as a as a as a school leader, you're then during that, for example, in Dubai, I uh, was always you know, hanging out with the, with the Arabic team, uh, wanted to get involved in everything they did, made sure we, we had, you know, a fantastic iftar during Ramadan. Um, during National Day, yeah, there's a picture online somewhere of me in the candor and the full get up because I wanted to show that, you know what, I, I, I want to experience this culture because this for me is super interesting. And to, to build those bridges and be a person who's willing to build those bridges and bring other people along. And I think the, the, the idea of the standoffish um, uh, principal who, who sets himself apart from the local environment is, is a very bad thing. Uh, and I think um, it doesn't show willing and doesn't show uh, willingness to, to appreciate and respect the culture. Um, I think the the second question here, the balance of educational business operations is incredibly difficult. And this would take an entire mm -hmm. webinar to, to go through. Um, I think in terms of uh, the education and business operations, that's about ensuring this communication between the two teams, uh, firstly. Um, and it's, it's, it's vital that both sides understand each other's aims and ambitions because the KPIs for the business team are going to be different for the KPIs for the education team. And, and it's, it's vital that both sides understand, look, this is a business, but also this is a school. And we need to yes. marry these, these two things together as much as possible. I think the, what comes beyond that is an understanding that educationally, success will mean a benefit to the business because it comes with results, it comes with stories to tell, it comes with students going to great universities, and it comes with word of mouth. And I think word of mouth is the, the key driver for many international schools, especially when you're startups and you're starting in a, in a new environment. So I think those uh, would be my two. But uh, Grania, you get three questions. Um, well, the, the, the first one about the most common mistake, I, I, in all honesty, I think the most common mistake is when there isn't real understanding between the company, uh, the group, the owner, the board, and the educators uh, led by the head on the ground. Um, I think there has to be uh, um, an absolute, you know, the closest possible marriage 
I, I don't yeah. think we should be able to get a, a cigarette paper between, you know, the board and the the head or the principal. I, I mean, you really do need to be um, totally in sympathy with each other and really understand what the other group's outcome needs to be or should be or what they want it to be. Uh, for example, I worked for a not-for-profit organization once and the biggest takeaway from that is A, I will never ever do that again and B, they did not understand the educational imperatives and I certainly did not understand the whole world of not-for-profit and fundraising. So I think it's a very uh, essential, um, deep understanding about the key components uh, before you even begin. Uh, what policy should you implement first? Very straightforward. Look, there are going to be loads of policies, but you have to, as an educator, you have to implement child protection, safeguarding and well-being. It does not matter how brilliant your language policy is or your swimming policy or your playground policy. It doesn't matter about any of those. You have to have your child protection, uh, safeguarding and well-being first, because that should touch every single aspect of the school, every child at every stage and indeed every staff member, because don't forget your safeguarding policies are about everybody being safe, whether you've got an armory or not. And um, I have a question here from Lee, Lee O'Hara, who says, I moved to China in August, one year before my school opens. What should my priorities be for my first two weeks? I would say, you know, just come to terms with where you are. In my first week here, I was told, by the CEO of this company, uh, she's in fact the founder of the company, and she said to me, Grania, she said, if you learn one thing while you were in China, please learn to have patience. And that was such <laughs> valuable advice. Yeah. So I would say, Lee, just find out where you are. Um, be calm. You know, you've got a whole year to open this school. Um, learn a bit of patience. I, I know that was difficult for me. And I would also suggest um, give me a call or link with me on LinkedIn and I can give you a few pointers. Fantastic. Ooh. Oh, so there was this is our book. It this is, is our yeah. book coming up. Could could I just say a little something about this? Would you would you mind? Because I think I mentioned this earlier on. I would have loved to have had something of this nature. Um, really user friendly, full of up to date information. You know that that that's a really because things are changing all the time full of up-to-date information from so many different points of view. Um, Andre and Chris have worked, oh my goodness, they've worked so hard on this project. And one of the great things about it is that there are lots of things in there that I fully resonate with. And there are some things in there about which I, I disagree. And that's one of its, uh, considerable strength, I feel. So anybody who is watching and anyone who is interested either in starting an international school or of course leading an international school at whatever stage, I would say this is your go-to. Um, it's very user-friendly, very straightforward, and it's really up to date. I would have loved this 25 years ago. Oh, it's good that I'm using it now. Um, it's uh, I think uh, Andre and Chris have, and um, and uh, Warren have, have, have managed to put together some amazing stuff with this. The um, I think we're we're coming to the end of uh, of the the webinar, and we're I'm just checking the clock. We're only ten minutes over, which I I think um, wow. uh, for teachers is probably not bad. 
um the um the the book is available online so if you check out amazon um and just type the title in you will have options will uh, will jump up at you um and if not do uh, get in touch with leading your international school via linkedin um and they will uh, enable you to they'll send you a link for for purchasing the book i think as well um i think now I mean, my my job here is is I suppose to summarise what we talked about, and I don't think I can. I think this has been a masterclass <laughs> um, in just advice and just ideas and just um, you know, the the one thing I would say for 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 startup uh, heads is that remember why you're in the post. Um, you're you're put in that post because you're the right person in the right place at, at the right time. And to have confidence, not just in, in yourself, but to have confidence in the people that you've appointed, to have confidence in the people who are around you, to have confidence to ask when you don't know, and to be that person who is a, a builder of relationships. I think that's what I've taken from what's what's been said today. Um, I think... Yeah. To be to be fair, we should um, give uh, the opportunity for some final thoughts. For I don't know if you've got kind of thirty seconds of, of final thoughts that you wanted to give, John, for for everyone listening. I think I would follow up with what you said: be flexible, be clear, be honest, and make time for yourself. Remember your own needs and your own mm. well-being. It's really important, and relationships. It all comes down to relationships up, down, sideways. That will make or break your your job. Fantastic. Grania, final thoughts? Um, I would say you can do it. I really would. You know, if I can do it, truly, trust me, if I can do it, you can do it. And it will be the most incredible experience you have ever had. Fantastic. And uh, what I would also say is reach out to people um, who are doing the job now. Mm -hmm. um, if we we always have, you know, a spare 10 minutes here or there um, to connect and to, you know, have conversations and to um, talk about the ins and outs and maybe, you know, what to think about, what not to think about if, if this is something that uh, you're going towards. Um, this is a great community. It's a great group of people. Educators are there for one reason, one reason only to give a great experience to the, the children in their care. And um, we want to make sure that everyone gets to have that opportunity to take on the responsibility of education. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Grania. Thank you, John. And thank you all of you thank listening you. today and, um, um, and listening on YouTube. Bye bye. Uh, thank you. I'll share thank a few you. Words. Thank you guys. I'll share a few words before we end today. So thank you everyone for joining us on our first ever leading your international special thanks to our webinar host Barry and two of our. So we will be hosting our next webinar on the international school sustainably on of August. And if you're interested in writing and submitting an article for us, please contact us via email at leadingyourinternationalschool at gmail.com. And also there's a survey link um, in the chat box, and we would really appreciate your feedback uh, on this webinar. Or if you have any questions, feel free to get in. Once again, thank you for joining us today. Let's all take a group photo together before we end this session. And feel free to switch.